Yeah, a common theme that's uh, come up in a couple of these sessions that uh, rang true with what I'm going to present here today is we develop these wonderful models in R and do these wonderful analyses, and uh, now we want to put them out into the world and make them useful. We want to build services. Um, we want to integrate them with our applications. So at this point, it's, it's not really obvious how to do that. We sort of went through a process. We built a service. Um, and, and in retrospect, it's not turned out to be not that difficult when it's blended with other sort of system engineering uh, tools and middleware. I think the hardest part was it wasn't obvious how to go about it. So anyway, this is not the only way to do it, but I think there's, there's definitely some, some lessons to be learned, and I'll, I'll describe what we did at, at Secure. <clears throat> um, oh. Is this, I just pushed this green button, right? Oh. Okay, so anyway, oh, sorry. <laughs> anyway, some, some, some background on secure. Um, as Stephanie mentioned, we do real-time fraud detection uh, based on social media and online data sources. Uh, the idea is to provide some sort of service that augments existing uh, fraud detection systems, provides additional lift by bringing in additional data that hasn't been considered before. It's useful for banks being able to expand their services, who they offer the services to without risk of increased fraud rates because they don't have a lot of credit information on individuals. Uh, we use predictive uh, R models. Uh, we use this initially to validate this, this notion that this data was valuable and that there was uh, a signal in there that, that was useful for fraud detection. Um, we usually, we, our service is exposed as a REST API. We're integrated with financial institutions and lenders via this API. They call us at some stage during their process, whether it's onboarding, um, loan applications. So there's a whole real-time component here where latency of our services is very critical. So that was a factor in designing this system. Since um, when we go out and collect social media data, a lot of it can be parallelized. But to generate the score, the final score at the end, that's sort of any latency in that is net additive on the overall latency of the system. And we have SLA was with our customers because of that. Um, another issue is as, as behaviors change, as new um, online data becomes available, our models evolve. So we have to have a facility to version models, upgrade models. And at the whole time with a real-time API is to have um, zero downtime upgrades of these models. Am I going? OK, there we go. Um, challenges. So R, for all its capabilities, um, it's typically not seen as a, oh, thank you. OK. It's not seen as a tool for developing sort of robust, scalable applications. Um, DevOps doesn't like it. It's something that's unfamiliar. Um, they're not sure what to do with it. And they have hesitation taking that into their, into their production stacks. Um, some options here for producing that we've seen, or that we considered for, for building the service was to train models and then extract those model parameters into another framework, say a Java implementation or, or some other language. So for us, we didn't go down that route because we saw it as an additional sort of whole QA doubling up on the QA where we had to sort of test and validate models and then test and validate again onto the platform that we transposed all that, uh, all those model parameters. Uh, another path was to use an enterprise service. Um, these are popping up. It's obviously a common use case and there seems to be a lot of activity in the market with services like DataRobot, H2O, um, that involve frameworks for training models and then managing those models and deploying them. So for a first startup, or for a nascent service that hasn't really proven out its ROI, these are quite a large investment. Um, another aspect is that these don't usually offer the full sort of set, the full gamut of models that, that are available if you're building uh, models in R. They're usually sort of a subset. They, they'll pick the, um, the common ones and optimize them for, for parallelized learning. Um, and also, these models aren't always transparent uh, or portable which is for us, especially in the financial industry, there's some sort of regulatory requirement that models are 
sort of transparent to some degree. Um, and obviously, with these models not being totally portable in all cases, there's the case for Levenda lock-in. Um, so our, our solution we took a bunch of sort of DevOps-friendly middleware and embedded our R application inside of that. Um, by making it look like something that's familiar to the DevOps and system engineers, uh, we managed to just to, to leverage our existing management deployment and integration systems and all our DevOps processes. And then we could uh, scale the service just using existing methods and strategies that we use for our other services. So here, I'm just going to walk you through the base. It's a very simple application. Um, the real intelligence of it is in the models, which these models are built by the data scientists. Uh, they're tested, validated. We pick the best models, pick the best features. So that's the normal sort of data science modeling workflow. So once we arrive at a model that we like, we'll serialize that model and save it as an RDS file. Those series, the, the models that we develop, we then drop inside a model directory, which uh, fits inside this application. So when this application starts up, now it's a very small application. It's just a very simple a couple of uh, R functions that uh, when, they, when they wake up, they look in the model directory, they look for RDS files, they read them in. And when we initially create these models, we tag the models with some metadata. We just, in, in our case, very simply just a name, model name and a model version number. So those are embedded inside the RDS object. So when these models are loaded up, the process reads that name and version and it adds them all to this in, an internal map that maintains the set of models that are available and their version and, and, and name. So the next step, we use the library, an R package called Rook, which uh, enables to expose a web endpoint for REST services within R. It also has functions for processing um, REST parameters, uh, post parameters, um, generating responses, and sending them back. So basically, that's the, sort of the front end to our application. Requests come in from application users via URL. In the URL, we encode the model name and version. That is stripped out by the Rook functions and used to look up a model in our model map. So once we have the model that's uh, been requested, uh, we just call the predict function on that model, passing it the inputs. And the response, so the score that's generated, we package up as a JSON object, and we return it to the caller. So in this case, um, the caller is actually our API, our, our main API, and we call this scoring service as an internal microservice. <clears throat> So at that point, we take this application, which is sort of the Rook and the model directory and the function for loading up the models, and to provide sort of the multi-processing and uh, multi-threaded scaling of this, we just embed it inside the Apache server. So we do this through a, there's an Apache module called R Apache, which is effectively a, an R interpreter that's embedded inside Apache. We configure it to when it loads up to load up our application over multiple processes. Um, we use the Apache pre-forking module because Apache you can multi you can sort of multi-process things by using a combination of threading and multi-processing um, th that offers some efficiency. We because we're not guaranteed thread safety with the R models, I, I'm not aware that they are thread safe, but to kind of remove all doubt, we just use the pre-fork, which is each each instantiation of the um, application occurs in its own separate process. So that's configured to come up and pre-start a minimum number, and then based on load, it can scale up to a maximum specified number. Um, so at this point, we now have a application that deploys under Apache, um, together with R and the integration R Apache module. Um, so another um, parallel sort of stream of development or sort of an, an enhancement of what we're doing, we're prototyping this at the moment, is to use PMML. So PMML is a predictive markup language. It's sort of an XML-based specification of predictive models. Um, it's an open standard supported by a bunch of um, different vendors. And we thought what we'd like to try is to, instead of just saving our models into an RDS binary format, to externalize them as a PMML. They're inspectable, so it satisfies the whole regulatory requirement. And then we have more technology options in terms of turning those into scorers. Um, 
in our case, we're going to be using the there's an open source Java um, JPMML evaluator, which you basically pointed at a PMML file and it creates a scorer for you. So at that point, we have a Java object, which it sort of becomes trivial to embed that inside a Java servlet and deploy it under Apache Tomcat. So at this point, it starts to look very much like, like a web app. Um, anyway, and then analogous to the previous slide with Apache, the deployment model is just deploy under Apache Tomcat, which is just a servlet engine. And then the multiprocessing occurs by the Tomcat engine creating multiple threads uh, across with Java scorers. So then the next step, the last step before sort of handing this whole happy bundle over to the um, DevOps team, we, we wrap this up into inside a Docker container, which is sort of a, it abstracts the whole OS, um, right from the OS level, which in this case you bind to, um, and then layering in the, Java, the R application that we built, the Apache with the Apache configuration, and uh, this recipe then builds an image, and this image can be used locally just to instantiate um, almost like a virtual machine to start up instances of the service for testing. These can also be pushed to a public Docker repo, and in our case, we're using a private Docker repo, which is actually that functionality. There's a new service in Amazon, uh, Elastic Container Services, where you can deploy your models. And then Elastic Beanstalk, which is Amazon's um, web service stack, can deploy directly from the repo in ECS or, or the public Docker repository. Um, so for development of these Docker images, you can do it natively on Ubuntu, or there's very good infra um, tools on um, alternative operating systems using virtual machines. It, it's all pretty seamless. Um, on OSX, the tool's called uh, Docker Machine. It, it's very, very easy to use. So at, at, at this point, we have a Docker image, and we deploy it to Elastic Beanstalk using the console. Um, at this point, DevOps sort of takes over and deploys the application, creates multiple environments for development, staging, production, parallel environments when we do upgrades. Um, it's just a matter of configuration through the console to distribute this across multiple geographic zones. And then within each zone, we can have multiple instances of the application. Um, we can set up auto scaling rules based on metrics, CPU usage, uh, throughput to auto scale the application up and down, depending on how many, uh, the load on the, on the application. So it's all very nice. Uh, through the console, at this point, it just looks like another web app. Through the, you can manage, DevOps will manage the life cycle of the application. They can manage application versions across different environments, stopping, starting, um, monitoring. Uh, as in the previous slide, all the metrics are automatically collected into an Amazon service called Amazon CloudWatch, so that's persisted and is, um, you could look at that at any point later. Um, here's one of the graphs, this is just, Tracking the error, uh, this is the, the success rate, HTTP 200, so that's basically a measure of the throughput of the application, non error. Um, and then for us, very important latency. We can monitor latency, we can see what's happening. Um, we sort of, have, we managed to, and this is in production, this has been in production for about a year now, um, managing production loads and also in a pilot environment where we actually spike load up to significant levels, multiples of what's in production. And we managed to keep latency to sort of averaging around 100 milliseconds. Um, that's, that's, uh, must have been a glitch there, that, that spike. But that, that would usually prompt a DevOps person being woken up based on a CloudWatch alarm that uh, is, is triggered by something like that. Um, so, so in conclusion, we've managed to take all of our hard work and these wonderful models in R and very quickly deploy them into a very scalable, robust environment. Um, in, in hindsight, I think the, the hardest part was coming up with the plan, but once the plan was in place, the actual custom code required to glue this all together is quite minimal. Um, I have a link to a GitHub site at the end. You'll see if you went and had a look, you'd be surprised how little code it is. Um, so we get to directly leverage our R models, develop our data scientists and analysts. Um, once deployed, we get to apply all our existing DevOps processes for testing, 
monitoring, scaling, and alerting if there's any issues with predictive models. And definitely down the road, we're kind of excited about using PMML to really open up the whole portability notion and technology options uh, and, and from the compliance perspective for using PMML. So there's a link to the GitHub repository. Um, I think the this, this slides will be available online so you can grab that link. But it's, it's basically the entire framework with all of our models thrown out and just some very simple models thrown in there. But it's, it's pretty obvious how you would just put your own models in there and deploy them. Uh, there's the scripts to build the Docker image and run it locally or to push it up to, to a Docker repo. And all the Apache configuration files that are required to actually get Apache up and running. Um, so thank you very much. If uh, you're interested in a project like this, and there's lots of other interesting work that we're doing, we're always looking for people on the data science side and the engineering side. Um, if you go to secure.com slash hiring, there's more, more detail on these positions. Oh, that's it.